How about those Phillies? How about those Phillies? I feel a little guilty beginning by talking about the Phillies because, truth be told, I'm a Johnny come lately. They are so exciting to watch. I wish I'd been watching all season long, but I haven't. I haven't. I've just been too damn busy. All this election, all this uh, Trump Michigas has gotten in my way, but I'm watching now. It was so much fun to watch last night and to see Charlie Manuel and to know that Ryan Howard is, you know, throw out the pitch tonight, as someone pointed out, brings back a lot of memories of, of 2008 when I was totally into it. You know, knee deep season tickets. Charlie was my guest on a regular basis. Great fun. Uh, Steve Cordasco from Mercer Advisors. Thank you, Steve, telling me about a new benefit to their already comprehensive wealth management offering. It's called Chapter. Mercer Advisors' new Medicare support partner that can help you make the proper Medicare decisions. I mean, who can navigate Medicare without assistance, right? Chapter is a team of licensed experts who can assist in understanding 24,000 coverage options at no cost to you if you call them, 855-558-3500. Learn how you can save, 855-558-3500. Cordasco Financial Network is a trade name owned by Mercer Global Advisors. They're an SEC registered investment advisor. Securities are offered through Andrew Garrett, Inc., uh, which is not affiliated with Cordasco Financial Network or Mercer Advisors. More information about Chapter and Mercer can be found in Mercer Advisors form ADV2A, ADV2A. Hey, can I change my lighting? Will you give me just a second? That's better, right? Well, 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 well. We're 17 days out, 17 days out. And if you've, if you've had enough of all the election talk, here's what you can look forward to. In 18 days, no, okay. In 18 days, we'll be talking about who won in 17 days. But in 19 days, in 19 days, then we can start talking about 2024 in earnest. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Um, on my CNN program today, I want to talk about the, the race in the Senate in particular. I mean, there really does seem to be a momentum shift or at least, how about this, a perception shift on the part of the pundit class of, of which I'm a proud member. You know, by way of illustration, if you were to go to Nate Silver's 538 blog, and I haven't been there this morning, but I was there last night, the odds of Democrats maintaining control of the Senate. And by the way, for today's poll question, where I say who will control the Senate, if it ends up with a 50-50 tie, that is Democratic control of the Senate because of Kamala Harris, the vice president, breaking ties. Because I was going to word the poll question today as, you know, Republicans, Democrats or tie. And then I thought, no, it's a tie. You know, Democrat. It's like it's like a house wins in gambling. If it's a tie, it's Democratic control today for the purpose of my survey question. We have Democratic control. Just know that as you as you vote. So back to Nate Silver, when I looked at his site last night, and I have a link to this at Smirconish.com, he was saying a 58% likelihood that Democrats maintain control of the Senate, you know, 58 out of 100, 58%. But if you read the column that he wrote, which I've linked to at Smirconish.com, he says, you know what, if a friend asks me, I don't know. I don't know. That's Nate Silver at 538. Just thinks it's a toss-up. If you go to Real Clear Politics, uh, and I talked about this on radio this week, Real Clear Politics says it's going to be 53-47 Republicans. And what's interesting about Real Clear Politics, again, building on the momentum theme, is that they are calling, they are projecting, you know, a lot of stuff can happen in 17 days, but they are projecting that both Pennsylvania and Georgia, where the data that they're relying on show Democrats ahead slightly, they nevertheless say it's going to end up in Republican hands. So don't hold me to this exactly, but but Fetterman's edge over Oz was, I think, 2.8 percent, according to the polls. They don't think it'll hold. They think that the Republican vote is undermeasured and that in Georgia, the race will come down to uh, a runoff. 
because you've got a libertarian in that election who's polling at about 4% or thereabouts. And if neither Warnock nor Walker gets 50% plus one, we go to a runoff. December 6th, I think. So, you know, it could be a very slim margin. Maybe it gets to 53. And meanwhile, in the House of Representatives, the presumption is Republicans will take control of the House. 26 is the average. Since World War II, 26 seats get picked up by the party outside the White House in a midterm election. And in this case, they only need, I think the number is five. So, yeah, given, I mean, you know, both sides have something in their arsenal to motivate their voters. Uh, for the Democrats, they've got January 6th to a certain extent. Um, they've got January 6th to a, to a certain extent. <clears throat> and they've also got abortion, although I'm looking for something, although maybe abortion is not going to be as potent as we initially thought. Then again, you look at Kansas, you look at New York's 19th, and, and maybe it will be. Um, on the issue of January 6th, I don't think it's moving the needle. I don't know that any of these things are moving the needle, except maybe inflation. But on the Democratic side of the aisle, you've got abortion and you've got January 6th. Of course, this is a big story today. Trump has now been subpoenaed for the January 6th committee and investigation. But as I said on Bill Maher last Friday night, Donald Trump should have been the first subpoena issued, not the last. And you know who should have been subpoena number two? Mike Pence. Mike Pence. And, and how could, I don't want to deviate to this, but how could Mike Pence not be, you know, clamoring to testify? If a mob of people got within 40 feet of you who wanted to hang you, would you not want to tell the whole story from your perspective? But he mistakenly thinks he's got a shot at the GOP nomination. I see none. Sorry, Mike Pence. It's Carrie Lake's world, and you're just living in it. <laughs> it's true. Um, it's not where the Republican Party is. He's, he, you know, Jeb Bush seemed to, to tether some Mike Pence thinking this week. They're birds of a feather. Respect them both. I respect them both. But they lack the passion that you need to emerge from the pack as a Republican candidate. I lost my place. Where was I? Oh, okay. So Democrats have January 6th. They have abortion. That's for real. Republicans have crime. Republicans have porous borders. Republicans have inflation. And inflation hits everybody. Um, I, I find it hard to believe that there's there was like this 16 or 17 uh, percentage point margin for independent women a month ago for D's that has swung all the way to the R's, which would make it like a 30 point flip. I, but, but okay, even if, even if you cut that in half, inflation hits everybody. Inflation hits everybody. So bottom line it, Michael. Okay. Bottom line, House looks like it goes Republican, Senate close, but momentum in the hands of Republicans, we think. Still, nothing would surprise me in terms of the outcome. And one of the races that I'm most interested in is Utah, is Utah. As you saw in the, the thumbnail here, might Evan McMullen become the most important person in Washington? Okay, well, what's this all about and who is Evan McMullen? Evan McMullen is a, is a conservative R, you know, with, with CIA credentials. You might remember he's an, he's a, a, an anti-Trumper who ran himself on this quixotic bid for a president as an independent and did well in a handful of Western states. He's a credible guy. He's been on radio with me before. He'll be on television with me today. So Evan McMullen steps forward to run as an independent for the United States Senate against Mike Lee, who was involved in all of Trump's shenanigans relative to January 6th. Mike Lee, a very conservative Republican facing opposition from a very conservative former Republican running as an independent in Utah. And when the Democratic Party assesses this situation, they fold their tent and they get behind Evan McMullen because they know they're not going to win putting up a D against Mike Lee in Utah. But hey, Evan McMullen, with the benefit of Ds in Utah, he could pull this off. And it's a competitive race right now within the margin of error. 
Well, imagine if Evan McMullen wins, because unlike Angus King and Bernie Sanders, who are independents, this is kind of amazing that that there's never any accountability. It's just I'm just making an observation here. It's not a criticism, but it's kind of interesting to me that Bernie Sanders is an I, or so he says. I don't think of him as an independent, but he's a registered independent, and then uh, caucuses with the D's. Well, when he runs for president, I find it interesting that nobody says, "Hey, Bernie, I thought you were an I, not a D." Angus King and Bernie Sanders do they? they caucus with parties. They don't maintain their independence in the Senate. Why? Because if you don't caucus with one of the parties, you don't get a committee assignment. So, okay, put it all together. If if Evan McMullen should win for senator from the, uh, the great state of Utah, um, he is saying, I'm not going to caucus with either party. Because I, I can't caucus with Mitch McConnell. I don't think that Mitch McConnell should be a Senate majority leader. And because of all of the things that I've said about January 6th, I mean, he's, you know, he's a constitutionalist. Evan McMullen doesn't appre- a- approve of and has been very critical of all of the attempts to overturn the election. So he, he says, I can't caucus with them. Um, and he also can't abandon the Democrats, seemingly, who supported him in Utah and put him on their ballot. But you, you can't see him caucusing with Schumer either. So he maintains that to the detriment of committee assignments, he'll, main, he'll, he'll, he'll be an independent. If he wins, and if that's the case, he becomes the mansion or cinema on steroids, on steroids. And, and I like that. I think that's a good thing. I, I think if we had four or five Evan McMullins, the balance of power in the Senate would be held by them. So that's why Utah really is deserving of um, of our attention. Now, I'll give you a contrarian view of this. Contrarian view is one by Natasha Noman, an MSNBC uh, opinion columnist. Headline, Ed McMullen's Senate bid might signal a dangerous new trend. Well, what's so dangerous about what I just described? Okay. Let me be fair. Let me be fair. First of all, she quotes Evan McMullen. Uh, While McMullen painted himself as a stalwart defender of democratic principles in refusing to caucus with either party and therefore be politically constrained, he also packaged his narrative with a lie, she says. We've seen it well enough over the past year or two, especially that the senators in the chamber who are willing to act with greater independence, serving their constituents, standing up to party bosses, standing up to extremist factions and special interest groups, they have the most influence in the chamber, he said. They're more influential, I think, than even the party bosses, and I want that for Utah. Yes, since the last election cycle, writes this critic, Kirsten Cinnamon and Manchin, have on occasion had even more influence in the Senate than party bosses, but that influence hasn't led to their standing up to reactionary policies or special interests. And then there's more to that argument. At a minimum, we should loudly reject Manchin's effort, but this points to a larger issue that a senator from a low population state, Utah has about 3 million, West Virginia, 1.7 million, can determine the American political landscape and make or break legislation that has policy implications for the whole world. That's not enough to persuade me that Evan Evan McMullen would would be a bad influence on the United States Senate. The fact that he comes from a low population state, uh, that's just not the way we're structured. Every state gets two United States senators. There's a reason and rationale for that. And he deserves to carry as much sway or more than any other member of the Senate, say I. McMullen's political posturing, in which he insists he will never caucus, betrays a more egoistic approach, a me and my state first approach, rather than a commitment to the broader ideals he claims to espouse. That's not how I see it. I think he's putting country first. I, I don't think he's saying, you know, th- this is what's best only for Utah. I think he's saying this is what's best for America. Too much power rests in the hands of the extremists. And I'd rather have an Evan McMullen in there and having people have to curry favor to him than some of the others on the far left or the far right. So that's what makes it such an interesting issue. 
focus on Utah. You know, of course, Pennsylvania is really interesting. Oh, here's something else I said on radio that I'm going to work into television today as, as well. Um, Tuesday is October 25th. Tuesday is October 25th. So the Phillies are now up, right? Phillies are up 2-1 with a game tonight and then another game on Sunday. Uh, theoretically, the Phillies could go up 3-1 to and then close out the series tomorrow. If it needs a game seven, that will be played on the 25th of October. That is the date of the one and only Pennsylvania debate. I, I think John Fetterman's got his fingers and toes crossed hoping the game goes to, to seven, because if it goes to seven, nobody, nobody's watching that debate. And, you know, he has put off the debate. He's resisted the efforts to have more than one debate. He, he wants to run out the clock. So I'm not saying Fetterman is hoping the Padres go on to the World Series. I am saying he hopes it takes seven games to close it out. In fact, I'll even give him the benefit of the doubt that he wants the Phillies to win. I have no idea. Um, but man, oh man, if if that is a game seven, nobody in at least the eastern half of Pennsylvania is going to be watching that debate. Whatever the clips are, you know, the clips will will be. But to sit and watch the debate, um, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Okay. So the way worded today at Smirconish.com, which party will control the Senate after the 2022 midterm, Republican or Democratic, which party controls the Senate? There's no such thing as a tie because Kamala Harris breaks the ties. So go vote on the website. Hey, thank you for all the, the comments about the uh, website. You see the voting weekday, how you know we had 20,000 people vote on a weekday a couple of days ago. And I, I, I know that's because We've delivered on the promise to make it nice and easy. Sure, you're going to see some ads. I mean, baby needs new shoes, okay? But um, it's a nice, clean, and uh, good user-friendly experience. So go vote. And while you're there, look around. There's so much comment. And, and one other thing, I'm particularly proud of today's links at Smirconish.com. I picked all 20 of them painstakingly picked all 20, wrote all 20 headlines. It takes an enormous amount of time. So all you need to do is scroll through them. And if a paywall gets in your way, it's okay. You'll still see the headline and the lead. And, and after two minutes, you'll, you will get balance delivered daily. And I'm trying to be a little bit pithy in the, uh, in, in the headlines too. Turn a friend onto the newsletter. Because it is it is what we need more of. It is what we need more of. Balance delivered daily. All right. Going to go get my noggin uh, uh, powdered. Do you think my sty healed? Not entirely, right? Yeah, not entirely. I know. I know. But pretty good. A hell of a lot better than I, than I looked two weeks ago. But, man, it's gone on for a couple of weeks. Have a wonderful day. Go Phils. See ya.